Today, we're going to tackle ECMO CPR. Extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That's the one. Should be familiar to all our healthcare provider listeners out there. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's a pretty fascinating area, you know, right on the edge of what we can do in emergency medicine. So true. I mean, it's basically for patients whose hearts have stopped and conventional CPR just isn't doing the trick. Yeah. Refractory cardiac arrest, we call that, when standard CPR just isn't cutting it. Right. And that's what ECMO comes in. It essentially acts as an artificial heart and lungs. Exactly. Keeping the blood oxygenated and circulating, buying the patient some time to recover. And that's the incredible thing, right? Studies show ECMO CPR can actually lead to higher rates of ROSC. Return of spontaneous circulation, yeah. The heart starts beating on its own again. Exactly. And it can even improve brain function after cardiac arrest. Yep. It's a game changer. No doubt about it. So to really understand ECMO CPR, we need to understand what refractory cardiac arrest is. Let's break that down. Perfect. Well, in simple terms, it's when uh, the heart's just not pumping blood effectively. Even with CPR, it's like the heart just isn't responding to the usual treatments. Got it. So that's where ECMO key steps in. How does it actually work? Okay, so... The most common type used for this is uh, veno-arterial ECMO, or VA ECMO. VA ECMO. Why that one specifically? Well, with VA ECMO, we drop blood from a vein, pump it into an ECMO machine, and that machine oxygenates the blood. Then it pumps that oxygen-rich blood back into an artery, totally bypassing the heart and lungs. Wow. So we can actually take those vital organs offline for a bit, give them a chance to heal. Exactly. It's like giving them a break, you know, a uh, much-needed break. Okay. This is fascinating. So who would be an ideal candidate for this? Well, there are a few things to consider. One is the type of cardiac arrest. Like the ideal candidate would be someone in ventricular fibrillation, which is like a chaotic heart rhythm. It doesn't respond well to the usual stuff, you know, defibrillation, meds, that sort of thing. So ECMO CPR becomes an option when other treatments have failed. Exactly. Timing is also super important. We're talking about a witnessed arrest, so we can intervene ASAP. Every second counts. Absolutely. And lastly, the cause of the arrest. ECMO CPR works best when the cause is, you know, potentially reversible. Right. If there's no chance of addressing the underlying problem, then ECMO wouldn't be the right approach. Makes sense, yeah. So with all its potential, ECMO CPR still has challenges, right? Oh, definitely. There are definitely challenges. Let's dive into those. Okay, well, logistics are a big one. ECMO requires, you know, specialized equipment, expertise. Patients often need to be transferred to specific centers that can handle it. And that must be a huge issue in rural areas. Absolutely. Rapid transport is absolutely critical because the longer the delay, the lower the chances of success. It's a race against time. Totally. And then there's the whole training aspect. You need a highly skilled team to administer ECMO CPR. It's not something just anyone can do. No, definitely not. You need specialized physicians, nurses, perfusionists. Everyone's got to be trained in ECMO specifically. And even then, complications can happen. What sorts of complications? Well, bleeding is a common one. Could be at the cannulation sites where the tubes are inserted or even internally. We also see neurological complications sometimes, like strokes, seizures. Those are serious. They can be, yeah. And there's always the risk of infections, blood clots, kidney problems, all kinds of things. It's a balancing act, really, weighing the benefits against the risks. That's a lot to consider. I imagine there are also ethical dilemmas that come with ECMO CPR. Oh, absolutely. It's a resource-intensive intervention. So there are questions about, you know, who should have access to it, especially considering socioeconomic factors. We're talking disparities in care, right? Exactly. Some people even use the term ECMO apartheid to describe that potential for unequal access based on socioeconomic status. That's a powerful term. It really highlights the ethical considerations we need to be aware of. It does. And then there are the end of life decisions that can come up, when to continue support, when to withdraw it. Those are never easy. A lot to grapple with, for sure. But at the end of the day, ECMO CPR offers hope in really desperate situations. It does. It really does. So how do we, you know, improve the implementation of ECMO CPR? How do we maximize its potential while addressing all these challenges? That's a very good question. Where do we start? Well, I think standardized protocols are key. You know, for patient selection, treatment, that would help with consistency and efficiency across the board. Clear guidelines for everyone to follow. Exactly. We also need better training programs for medical professionals, not just the technical stuff, but also managing complications, the ethical aspects, all of it. So we're talking about giving healthcare providers the tools they need to make informed decisions 
in these really complex situations. Precisely. And the infrastructure itself needs to be addressed. We need to make sure ECMO is available where it's needed. Maybe a hub and spoke model where specialized ECMO centers support surrounding hospitals. That could help with those transport issues, especially in rural areas. Exactly. And of course, research is ongoing. We need to keep refining techniques, minimizing complications, improving how we select patients. The more we learn, the better. Absolutely. We need to keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible while being mindful of the ethical and logistical considerations. Couldn't agree more. So often patients need to be transferred to designated ECMO centers. What are the implications of that? The biggest one is time. I mean, every minute counts when someone's heart isn't beating effectively. Delays in transport, those can really impact the success of ECMO CPR. This is especially true in rural areas where access to specialized care is already limited. So geography plays a role in who can benefit from ECMO CPR. Unfortunately, yes. It really highlights the need for better infrastructure and coordination between healthcare facilities. Now, moving on, let's talk about the clinical side of things, the challenges specific to ECMO CPR. We've mentioned the potential complications, but let's go into more detail, starting with bleeding. Sure, that's a big one. Why is bleeding such a concern with ECMO CPR? Well, as I mentioned before, to prevent blood clots in the ECMO circuit, patients need anticoagulation therapy. Basically, it thins the blood, which obviously makes them more prone to bleeding. It's a balancing act, then, between preventing clots and managing bleeding risk. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The medical team has to constantly monitor the patient's coagulation status and adjust the therapy accordingly. What are some other clinical challenges we should be aware of? Well, neurological complications are another big one. During cardiac arrest, the brain doesn't get enough oxygen, which can lead to things like stroke or seizures. And can the ECMO CPR procedure itself contribute to those neurological problems. It's possible, though rare. I mean, ECMO aims to restore blood flow to the brain, but there's a small risk that air bubbles or clots could dislodge from the ECMO circuit and travel to the brain, potentially causing a stroke. So it's like a double-edged sword. You're trying to restore blood flow while also trying to prevent further damage. Precisely. And then there are infections. We're inserting large cannulae into major blood vessels, which can create an entry point for bacteria. So sterile technique is absolutely critical. Absolutely. Even with the best sterile technique, infections can still occur, especially since these patients are often in a weakened state to begin with. What about complications related to other organ systems? The kidneys are another area of concern. During cardiac arrest, blood flow to the kidneys is reduced, which can lead to acute kidney injury. ECMO can help restore that blood flow, but the kidneys can still be vulnerable to damage. So keeping a close eye on kidney function is really important during ECMO CPR. Absolutely. We do regular blood tests to make sure the kidneys are functioning properly. Okay, so we've talked about bleeding, neurological issues, infections, and kidney problems. Are there any other clinical challenges associated with ECMO CPR? Yes. While rare, we can also have mechanical complications with the ECMO machine itself. It's a complex piece of equipment, so there's always the possibility of a malfunction. Like what? What kind of malfunctions? Oh, well, the pump could fail, or there could be leaks or blockages in the tubing. These situations require a quick response from a well-trained team. So it's not just about the human element. We also have to make sure the technology is working properly. Exactly. This has been a really helpful discussion about the clinical challenges of ECMO CPR. It's a complex procedure that requires a lot of skill and vigilance. I agree. It's a powerful tool with the potential to save lives, but we have to be mindful of the inherent risks and manage those risks effectively. Absolutely. Standardized protocols would address several key areas. First, patient selection criteria. We need to clearly define which patients are most likely to benefit from ECMO to make sure we're using resources appropriately. So objective criteria to guide those decisions. Exactly. The protocols would also outline the steps for activating the ECMO retrieval team, including the information that needs to be communicated. Streamlining the process and minimizing delays. Right. And then the protocols would detail the procedures for cannulation, ECMO initiation, and ongoing patient management. That way, everyone is following the same best practices, regardless of their location or experience. So it's about reducing variability and ensuring consistency in care. Exactly. Standardized protocols also usually address transport, communication, and data collection. 
They might specify the preferred mode of transport for ECMO patients, outline communication channels between providers, and establish procedures for documenting key clinical data. That creates a more comprehensive and coordinated approach to ECMO CPR. Exactly. And the great thing about standardized protocols is that they can be adapted and improved over time as we learn more and identify areas where we can do better. So they're not set in stone. They're a framework for best practices that can evolve as our understanding of ECMO CPR grows. Precisely. Standardized protocols are essential. They help optimize how we implement ECMO CPR, promote patient safety, and ultimately improve outcomes. Remember, ECMO CPR is a constantly evolving field, and we have to stay curious, keep learning, collaborate with each other, and never stop innovating. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.